during his general audience on the 20th of October, 2010. Pope Benedict XVI continued his catechesis on the saints by discussing St. Elizabeth of Hungary. This is a reading in the English translation of that audience. Dear brothers and sisters, Today I would like to speak to you about one of the women of the Middle Ages who inspired the greatest admiration. She is Saint Elizabeth of Hungary, also called Saint Elizabeth of Thuringia. Elizabeth was born in 1207, and historians dispute her birthplace. Her father was Andrew II, the rich and powerful king of Hungary. To reinforce political ties, he had married the German Countess Gertrude of Andax Maran, sister of St. Hedwig, who was the wife of the Duke of Silesia. Elizabeth, together with her sister and three brothers, spent only the first four years of her childhood at the Hungarian court. She liked playing, music, and dancing. She recited her prayers faithfully and already showed special attention to the poor, whom she helped with a kind word or an affectionate gesture. Her happy childhood was suddenly interrupted when some knights arrived from distant Thuringia to escort her to her new residence in central Germany. In fact, complying with the customs of that time, Elizabeth's father had arranged for her to become a princess of Thuringia. The Landgrave, or Count of this region, was one of the richest and most influential sovereigns in Europe at the beginning of the 13th century, and his castle was a center of magnificence and culture. However, the festivities and apparent glory concealed the ambition of feudal princes, who were frequently warring with each other and in conflict with the royal and imperial authorities. In this context, the Landgrave Hermann very willingly accepted the betrothal of his son Ludwig to the Hungarian princess. Elizabeth left her homeland with a rich dowry and a large entourage, including her personal ladies-in-waiting, two of whom were to remain faithful friends to the very end. It's they who left us the precious information of the childhood and life of this saint. They reached Eisenach after a long journey and made the ascent to the fortress of Wartburg, the strong castle towering over the city. It was here that the betrothal of Ludwig and Elizabeth was celebrated. In the ensuing years, while Ludwig learned the knightly profession, Elizabeth and her companions studied German, French, Latin, music, literature, and embroidery. Despite the fact that political reasons had determined their betrothal, a sincere love developed between the two young people, enlivened by faith and the desire to do God's will. On his father's death, when Ludwig was 18 years old, he began to reign over Thuringia. Elizabeth, however, became the object of critical whispers because her behavior was in Congress with court life. Hence, their marriage celebrations were far from sumptuous, and a part of the funds destined for the banquet were donated to the poor. With her profound sensitivity, Elizabeth saw the contradictions between the faith professed and Christian practice. She could not bear compromise. Once, on entering a church on the Feast of the Assumption, she took off her crown, laid it before the crucifix, and covering her face, lay prostrate on the ground. When her mother-in-law reprimanded her for this gesture, Elizabeth answered, How can I, a wretched creature, continue to wear a crown of earthly dignity when I see my King Jesus Christ crowned with thorns? She behaved to her subjects in the same way that she behaved to God. Among the sayings of the four maids, we find this testimony, quote, She did not eat any food before ascertaining that it came from her husband's property or legitimate possessions. While she abstained from goods procured illegally, she also did her utmost to provide compensation to those who had suffered violence, end quote. She is a true example for all who have roles of leadership. The exercise of authority at every level must be lived as a service to justice and charity and the constant search for the common good. Elizabeth diligently practiced works of mercy. She would give food and drink to those who knocked at her door. She procured clothing, paid debts, cared for the sick, and buried the dead. Coming down from her castle, she often visited the homes of the poor with her ladies-in-waiting, 
bringing them bread, meat, flour, and other staples. She distributed the food personally and attentively checked the clothing and mattresses of the poor. This behavior was reported to her husband, who not only was not displeased, but answered to her accusers, so long as she does not sell the castle, I'm happy with her. The miracle of the loaves that were changed to roses fits into this context. While Elizabeth was on her way with her apron filled with bread for the poor, she met her husband, who asked her what she was carrying. She opened her apron to show him, and instead of bread, it was full of magnificent roses. This symbol of charity often features in depictions of St. Elizabeth. Elizabeth's marriage was profoundly happy. She helped her husband to raise his human qualities to a supernatural level, and he, in exchange, stood up for his wife's generosity to the poor and for her religious practices. Increasingly admired for his wife's great faith, Ludwig said to her, referring to her attention to the poor, Dear Elizabeth, it is Christ whom you have cleansed, nourished, and cared for. A clear witness to how faith and love of God and neighbor strengthen family life and deepen evermore the matrimonial union. The young couple found spiritual support in the Friars Minor, who began to spread through Thuringia in 1222. Elizabeth chose from them the Friar Rodiger as her spiritual director. When he told her about the event of the conversion of Francis of Assisi, a rich young merchant, Elizabeth was even more enthusiastic in the journey of her Christian life. From that time, she became even more determined to follow the poor and crucified Christ, present in poor people. Even when her first son was born, followed by two other children, our saint never neglected her charitable works. She also helped the Friars Minor to build a convent at Halberstadt, of which Friar Rodinger became superior. For this reason, Elizabeth's spiritual direction was taken on by Conrad of Marburg. The farewell to her husband was a hard trial, when, at the end of June in 1227, Ludwig IV joined the crusade of Emperor Frederick II. He reminded his wife that this was traditional for the sovereigns of Thuringia. And Elizabeth answered him, quote, Far be it for me to detain you. I give my whole self to God, and now I must also give him you. However, fever decimated the troops, and Ludwig himself fell ill and died in Otranto before embarking in September of 1227. He was 27 years old. When Elizabeth learned the news, she was so sorrowful that she withdrew into solitude. But then, strengthened by prayer and comforted by the hope of seeing him again in the afterlife, she began to attend to the affairs of the kingdom. However, another trial lay in wait for her. Her brother-in-law usurped the government of Thuringia, declaring himself to be the true heir of Ludwig and accusing Elizabeth of being a pious woman incapable of ruling. The young widow, with three children, was banished from the castle of Wartburg and went in search of a place of refuge. Only two of her ladies-in-waiting remained with her. They accompanied her and entrusted the three children to the care of Ludwig's friends. Wandering through the villages, Elizabeth worked wherever she was welcome, looking after the sick, spinning thread, cooking. During this Calvary, which she bore with great faith, with patience, and with dedication to God, a few relatives who had stayed faithful to her and viewed her brother-in-law's rule as illegal restored her reputation. So it was in the beginning of 1228, Elizabeth received sufficient income to withdraw to the family's castle in Marburg, where her spiritual director, Fra Conrad, also lived. It was he who reported the following event to Pope Gregory IX. Quote, on Good Friday in 1228, having placed her hands on the altar in the chapel of her city, Eisenach, to which she had welcomed the friar's minor and in the presence of several friars and relatives, Elizabeth renounced her own will and all the vanities of the world. She also wanted to resign all her possessions, but I dissuaded her out of love for the poor. Shortly afterwards, she built a hospital, gathered the sick and invalids, and served at her own table the most wretched and deprived. When I reprimanded her for these things, Elizabeth answered that she received from the poor special grace, and humility. 
We can discern in this affirmation a certain mystical experience similar to that of St. Francis. The Poverello of Assisi declared in his testament, in fact, that serving lepers, which he first found repugnant, was transformed into a sweetness of the soul and of the body. Elizabeth spent her last three years in the hospital she founded, serving the sick, keeping wake over the dying. She always tried to carry out the most humble services and most repugnant tasks. She became what we might call a consecrated woman in the world, and with other friends clothed in gray habits formed a religious community. It's not by chance that she is the patroness of the Third Order Regular of St. Francis and of the Franciscan Secular Order. In November 1231, she was stricken with a high fever. When news of her illness spread, many people flocked to see her, and after about ten days she asked for the doors to be closed that she might be alone with God. In the night of 17 November, she fell asleep gently in the Lord. The testimonies of her holiness were so many, and such that after only four years, Pope Gregory the Ninth canonized her, and that same year, the beautiful church built in her honor at Marburg was consecrated. Dear brothers and sisters, in St. Elizabeth, we see how faith and friendship with Christ created a sense of justice, of equality of all, of the rights of others, and how they create love and charity. And from this charity is born hope too, the certainty that we are loved by Christ and that the love of Christ awaits us thereby, rendering us capable of imitating Christ and seeing Christ in others. St. Elizabeth invites us to rediscover Christ, to love Him and have faith, and thereby find true justice and love, as well as the joy that one day we shall be immersed in divine love, in the joy of eternity with God. Thank you. That was a reading of the audience of Pope Benedict XVI from the 20th of October in 2010.